Welcome back. It's The Real Story with Jeannie Ives. And the topic today is going to be all about the gun ban and what's happening on guns around the state and the country. Let's start out with this um, item. Last Friday, a federal judge decided to say halt the gun ban law that went into effect or, you know, supposedly in January. He said, nope, you go ahead. You can purchase whatever weapons you want. Remember, that law banned over 170 different types of guns that people commonly bought. Now, they weren't uh, you know, they weren't assault rifles. They, they weren't machine guns or anything. They were simply guns that people purchase to hunt for their own protection and in various ways. Then we also had at the same time, because we have there's so many gun cases going around in the state. The other one deals with Robert Beavis. And if you don't remember Robert Beavis, I did a real story interview with him not that long ago. Because remember, he's the Naperville gun shop owner who, who uh, basically Naperville said, we don't want anybody to sell any guns whatsoever in Naperville. We're going to ban the sale of, of guns in Naperville. And this actually came on the heels of the Highland Park shooting that occurred occurred last July, which is why I'm going to, I have my guest here as well. We're going to talk about that. But an update to Bob Beavis's case. Bob Beavis uh, filed a lawsuit in federal court, and they have now, because he's literally almost out of money, it's so sad. I mean, I'm going to have him on an additional podcast on this. They are bankrupting this man for selling guns that are legal. And by the way, and I think this is the most outrageous thing, so stick with me before I introduce my guest, but stick with me on this thing. The, The gun ban law literally says that if you're an Illinois resident, you can't own these guns going forward. If you already own these guns, guess what? You have to register with the state that you own these guns. We do not want a gun registry. That is not a Second Amendment right. But it gets worse because they said if you are a gun manufacturer in the state of Illinois, go right ahead. Make all these guns. Sell them to Indiana, sell them to Iowa, sell them anywhere else you want. Just don't sell them to Illinois gun retailers. Now, is that insanity? They're worried about the guns, but they're letting the gun manufacturers still manufacture them and sell them elsewhere across the United States. It is insane. Everything about this policy is insane. It does not get to the root causes of gun violence and what creates it. So we've got a couple different cases going on. There's actually two different state cases going on on the gun ban law. There are federal cases going on the gun ban law. And then there is Bob Beavis's case against Naperville. Now he's countersuing Naperville for loss of income and also in, and, and, and civil rights um, action as well. He's got another lawsuit against them. Um, the Supreme Court is looking into basically doing a, an immediate injunction a, a, um, to, to allow him to sell weapons because he's essentially, they're bankrupting him intentionally. This is so shameful of the city of Naperville to do it because he could literally just locate across the street in Lyle. Of course, that would cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars to move his shop, but they don't care. Oh, go to Lyle and buy your gun. Come back over to Naperville and, you know, go ahead, go to their shooting range and shoot it there in Naperville, but you can't buy a gun there. I mean, this is so stupid. Okay, so we've got all that going on in gun action, and then what happens? Well... That brings in my guest. My guest today in this today's podcast is Susie Wall. Susie Wall is a Highland Park resident, and she's also a mental health expert, which is another reason <laughs> she's perfect for this, uh, this podcast. And Susie is also a parent who is concerned about what happened on high, in Highland Park um, High School on April 4th. Now, I was reading the Chicago Tribune article. You lived through it to some degree, but let's just kind of recap what happened. Sure. Essentially, um, the Highland Park students had planned to have a protest, and their protest was all about banning assault weapons, yes. which they don't couldn't even identify assault weapons no, if they, they really had to. They couldn't. No. They don't have the, that background or knowledge. But they wanted a nationwide assault weapons ban. Mm-hmm. That same day that the students did a walkout protest mm-hmm. for this, mm-hmm. that same time, mm-hmm. five other students got found themselves arrested because mm-hmm. one student actually brought a gun into 
the high school. Yep. So tell me if I've got that right, and then tell me a little bit more about what happened. Absolutely. You do have that right. And thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I'm not happy with the situation, obviously, but... Um, Yes, so as a parent, you really never want to get a text from the school saying we're on a hard lockdown, and that's exactly what happened on April 4th. I was working at home, as I do, you know, on my computer, and I I hear a text come in, pick up my phone, and it's Highland Park High School is on a hard lockdown. Check your email, and, you know, of course you start calling the school. The line is, you actually get a busy signal, which I hadn't heard probably since 1985, and... You know, you don't know what's happening. It's it's terrifying for a parent. But um, my daughter and Highland Park High School was on a hard lockdown for about two hours. Um, they were on the floor. She was in physics class. She They were behind the physics lab table hiding. The physics teacher, who's about 60 years old and just had knee surgery, was at the classroom door with a sledgehammer. And, you know, I find this all out later. They were dismissed about two and a half hours early. They ended the school day about 1225, and we were able to go pick them up. My daughter actually ended up taking the bus home because we found out at 1222 they were being dismissed at 1225. So the day itself was really terrifying, and sadly we we didn't have any information until much, much later, and we still don't know exactly what happened. We do know that... One student, five initially were arrested, but I think one was the actual gun holder and kept in custody. I don't know if that person is still in custody. I don't think they're back at school, but again, the school board will share nothing with us. So you're getting no information from the school board? None. Um, And and, and so, I mean, this is terrifying because as you told me earlier, this is literally nine months to the day to from the, day. the July, July 4th tragedy exactly. where dozens of people were slaughtered Yes, needlessly by a maniac sitting on top of the roof and aiming at people watching right. the 4th of July parade. Right. I mean, Highland Park's been through a lot. We have been through a lot. 100%. When it comes to guns and especially gun yes. violence. We've been through a lot. And I will say that this April 4th incident was completely preventable. You know, I go back to 1988 when Lori Dan shot up a school in Winnetka. Tell us about that because that is a story that I was not aware of until you brought it up. Yes. And I think it's really important for people to to realize this because they think this is just a modern phenomenon. No. That the the, the mass shooting thing is, I mean, granted, maybe it's modern in terms of you know, it's um, 1980s on type of right. thing. I mean, we, we yeah. didn't probably see this in the 1920s so much or anything like that. But it's not like it just all started in the last decade. No, no, no especially, especially, you know, I feel, and a security talks, expert who I can refer to later told me the North Shore schools are really a soft target. And that started in 1988 with Lori Dan. She went into, it was an elementary school in Winnetka, Hubbard Woods area. I think it's actually called Hubbard Woods Elementary, maybe. And six people were shot. One young boy lost his life. And what's shocking to me is I actually pulled up that footage a few days ago. And really, except for the clothing and hair, it could literally be the same scene that was all over the news on April 4th in Highland Park. Literally the same. And to me, it's unconscionable. Why are we not protecting our most precious assets? You know, I actually worked um, another part of my background for United Airlines and 21 years, and I worked for them, you know, September 11th. I was there. It was awful. We lost colleagues. You know, the loss of life then was astounding. But after that loss of life, an entire new government agency was created, the TSA, Mm -hmm. you know, and they're... um, Every day they're they're violating their, our constitutional rights to, you know, unlawful search and seizure, right? And everyone just accepts this. And this agency is extremely well funded. Every airport, you know, in fact, when I worked for United, there were certain third world, um, certain cities in third world countries we wouldn't fly to for lack of security. Now we're protecting, you know, rightfully so, all the airline passengers, all the airport staff, all our staff on board. However, we don't protect our most precious assets. Our well, children. and that was proven out in the Covenant, uh, the Covenant uh, yes. school shooting that just happened, and unf- and uh, like it's it's just un- alarming because it yes. happens literally 
10 days, two weeks before the April 4th incident. I know. So everybody's parent has that that on their mind. Of and course. then they get the call that we're in lockdown. Yeah, it was and actually then, a text. I mean, yes, if you can believe text, it. And no one, no one you could call. And I was, of course, texting and calling my daughter, you know, incessantly. And she says she could hear, she has her phone on vibrate during the day. Um, she could hear her phone in her backpack vibrating, but she was on the floor across the room. So, so, so they, this was actual an, a real incident. Yes, there were five kids arrested. Yes. There was one that did have an actual gun. An actual gun, yes. Um, it, to your knowledge, nobody knows his whereabouts. Nobody knows what's happened to him. Nobody knows anything about him because he's a minor. He's a minor, so, so no information. No information has whatsoever. Released. Regardless, though, that you would think yes. that you would at least, you, without divulging a name or anything, right. you would get some idea right. about what is be, uh, happening with him. A hundred percent. Now, are any of those children still back at? school? school i think that the other four i have heard that they are back at school okay although i know my daughter is a freshman so she doesn't personally know these kids so i can't 100 percent verify but i have heard that so you, you guys are not <laughs> crazy right wingers you're not crazy no. liberals you're just parents who want their kids we're, protected we're and so parents. a group of you got together a very quickly and went to the very, school board meeting and right. how did that go so um thankfully a group of us some of us already knew each other we got together um one of our very prominent members jenny who you've had here jenny yes. Harjong, she's been a huge advocate for metal detectors in schools so of course in, we in wrote fact, let's in. just pause there yes. remember because if you if you have been following the real story with Jeannie ives yes. i had jenny Harjong on right after the the highland park shooting because she really wanted to get her the message out yes. about this and this was again this was like probably the end of july by the time yes. i got her on my podcast and her biggest concern yes was how do i send my kids back to school yes. safely that was her number one concern a hundred percent and she as always was spot on mm -hmm. you know it was almost like a prophecy and i i am so thankful i will say first of all this was for highland park high school a cheap warning we and i said that to the board um we got off yes our kids are emotionally they, they are definitely damaged but we got off without anyone being physically harmed my god and if you combine april 4th and july 4th i would say to, and i've said to our board uh, we have said what more do you need it's as if they're actually waiting for carnage before they do something so back to your question yes a group of us organized and we went the board called a security meeting a special security meeting on april 11th so mm -hmm. took them an entire week and at that meeting, there was, of course, public comment. And luckily, we had been organized. We had about um, five, six of us. We completely controlled the narrative. And then, Jeannie, it was almost um, surreal. The way the board spoke after we spoke, it, it was as if we were reading them our grandmother's tuna casserole recipes or reading out of the phone book. It was almost like we didn't even speak to them. One of the board members, and, and I'm not making this up, it is on the recording, even spoke about, well, you know, if we think about metal detectors, we have to think about equity. Dan Strzok, one of the board members. And what does yes, that mean? I wish I knew. To me, it seems like a bit, a little bit of a veiled racist comment. Okay, but let's be honest with you. But I don't you. know. You, I, I believe at one point they did show a picture per, of the alleged yes. um, a, a perpetrator. Yes. I mean, he didn't shoot, but the alleged uh, uh, guy who brought this, the weapon yes. to school. And I believe he's Hispanic. I believe he's of Hispanic descent. I believe, but I don't, again, okay. I don't know personally. But what, does, Are there any other rumors surrounding him? Yeah, there are rumors of gang ties as well. And, okay. and I do believe this person lives in Highwood. And so Highwood what's the equity have, there? What's the equity question? I don't get that. You know, and, and here's a... a what uh, what has what do metal detectors have to do with equity? I would it doesn't matter who you know. are when you go through a TSA line. Yes, <laughs> you, you are searched. It's you like are going to communion. It Honestly, is. Honestly, all 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 it all is. are welcome. All comers yes. got to go through the line. Got to do yes. the right ritual. And I think you know I don't get that. I I don't either. I don't, I don't understand. But I think you know. And I would say to this member. Forget equity. Our our children are in danger. They're they're not black children, white children, Hispanic children, Asian children. They are our children. They are in danger. 
I don't care what race they are. If you shoot a child, if a child dies, that What's is their a, solution. Did they ha- have they do they have a solution? So we've had to go back to another board meeting two weeks later on April 25th. And I will okay. say we've done extensive media outreach and thank goodness we've had media coverage. We had to get in front of the board again. And, you know, in, in some of my clips, you'll see I'm actually shouting at them. And I'm generally a nice level-headed person but when I get in front of these people who, yeah because it's blank stare it's blank stare and and they are holding my child's life in their hands and I want to say to them how dare you how dare you be so complacent so lazy and all they're doing is pontificating lots of virtue signaling but at the last meeting they actually I, I mean our our superintendent actually said out loud, like you're not supposed to say the quiet part out loud. Um, wow, if we do metal detectors in Highland Park, I guess we'd have to do them in Deerfield too. And he's the superintendent of District 113, which is Deerfield and Highland Park High School. There's your equity, right? Of course you're going to do them at both high schools. Of course you would. And but, you, but it's it can't be cost. Let's be honest. These guys no, are not. flush with cash. Flush. So, I, we, 29200 oh, per oh, student spend. I've got, got the 29200 per student spend. Actually, 233. Do you, happen to, do you happen to have their um, academic achievement score? I mean, I'm happy to lo- look it up. I, I forgot I don't to look have it, it uh, but I'm happy to look that yeah. up while we discuss other things. But of I mean, course. because but if you want 29200 per student. 233, yes. And, and by, by comparison, comparison, I did... Um, I did, I did state all this at the board meeting, but um, CPS, Chicago Public Schools, spends 29307 so about $74 more per student. They have metal detectors. Oh, okay, so C- wait a minute. So CPS has metal detectors. In the high schools. I've seen them, yes. In their high schools. Mm-hmm. So it's got to be, I think it's their image. It's they can, they just like would ruin their image that they're a community, right? Because look, we're the community that yes. that loves on people. Yes. We're the community we, that we're Highland Park strong. We're Highland Park strong, exactly. You right? Know? Yeah. What does that we mean? Don't, I, do, it's it, you know, it is unfortunately. Hate has no home there. Right. Hate, Hate has, has no, no home. home there. You know, so and you I can't think, then put metal detectors in the high school, because right? Because Hate has no home, right? And, and I see what well, that's just, that's just uh, yeah, I, I think unfortunately, what we've seen of this board is that they're very committed to virtue signaling uh-huh. and very uncommitted to action. And it it really defies logic, but at least at the last board meeting, they were kind of talking about metal detectors. At least the words came out of their mouth. And then after the board meeting, we got an email that they're going to, Hire or hire or use a consultant they've used in the past. I'm not sure which, and there will be another meeting yet on May 30th. So we're almost you know two months out from the incident, and they've made it clear that nothing will happen in next year, till next year. Also, Bruce Law, our w- overpaid um, superintendent. It can't be that difficult to put in a metal t- detector. Like it could have no. been done. Oh, Probably it could have within been done a week. by April 11th when they had the first meeting. Sure. So now we're two board meetings. We're on the edge of a third. Sure. And I will tell the board, we're going to be prepared for that meeting. And if they think there's been media presence to date, has, has, we'll what, is, what does the union say? What does the teacher union say? What do teachers say? Or do they just zip so it? So 113 is not unionized. Oh, yeah. okay. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? But I have, I've reached out to one teacher who I know to be conservative, and I thought that she and I could have a dialogue, and there's been no reply. I think the teachers are scared to stand up. It's amazing that... It seems to me that people, Highland Park residents and teachers, staff, are scared of this board. And they are, there's nothing to be scared of. They have, they have no no merit whatsoever that I've seen. What are you scared of? And, you know, as a mom, my primary duty is to protect my child. So if there's a target on my back, I'm going to actually wear that as a badge of honor. I'm going to bring it to my front and say, go ahead. Bring it on. 
game on. I'm going to protect my child what no matter does the, what. Did the police chief say anything? Do you know, is he part of this conversation? Is the mayor? I mean, let's face oh. it. If people, people may not realize, I mean, Highland Park is one of two communities, if not the only one, yes. who in 2013, when we passed a concealed yes. carry law, they immediately passed a law saying that they will be, you know, assault weapons free. Assault weapons, weapons free. And so, look how that panned yeah. out. On and July they only 4th. had 10 days to do that. And right. of course it panned out not whatsoever because yeah, they weren't able to do nothing. anything. And again, the, the hate has no home crowd right. there, right? Don't it forget the gun stickers, stickers with the circle and the line through Okay, it. so they, they have those lots stickers of those. too. Lots of those. And, and what that says, you combine those stickers with the assault weapons ban, it says we and they, are they ha- sitting ducks in Highland Park. Well, they That's had all the most says. horrific tragedy that, yes. that, that I can think of yes. in around Illinois. A hundred percent. I mean, can, is there another one? No, I mean the, the tragedy, tragedy that I remember most before that is the Lori Dan incident, and there was only one death. Whereas Highland Park, I think the total death was six. But I don't know the I don't know the number of injured for the July Fourth incident. But yes, dozens. Oh, it was dozens, oh, dozens. Oh, absolutely, dozens dozens or something. Or but what, I believe whatever. the total death count six. Mm-hmm. And so, in it's terms of the sick. North Shore, those two tragedies stand mm-hmm. out. And on April fourth, I want to say we almost had another tragedy, tragedy, but completely preventable, completely. I mean, and, and you said how easy it is to buy metal detectors. If you go online right now, Uline, which is a very smart company that headquartered in Pleasant Prairie, instead of coming to Illinois. You can order one for about 4000 You could literally drive up to Pleasant Prairie and grab it and have it within a day. If our board wanted to do something, they would be doing it. So now what Bruce Law says, they're hiring. Bruce Law is the superintendent the for superintendent people who are listening. He's the superintendent who, who used to be at Hinsdale. He used to be in District 86. And now his whole package is about $300,000. About $300,000. And District 86, they had a petition to get rid of him. They were successful. Oh, and so then he ends up in Highland Park. So, so yeah. a very, very well. Healthy District Hinsdale, yes, yes. Um, it gets yes. rid of their superintendent, and yes. he ends up in another very, very wealthy district, yes. Highland Park, yes. as the superintendent. Yes, and, and guess, guess what? Hinsdale started testing in January. What metal detectors? Oh, yes, and I'd love to if you indulge me for a second. Yes, could I read absolutely. the last line? So Hinsdale had this petition circulating. They got about 380, 390 signatures, which is pretty good mm-hmm. for a high school district. And what they said about Bruce Law, I mean, it's quite long, but the last line I think is so poignant. And I will say this about Bruce Law and our board. And they said, most of all, our students deserve a superintendent who values their well-being more than anything else. And this board does not value the well-being of our community, the well-being of our students, the well-being of our parents. Are you anticipating another petition to oust him again? I would like to start one. However, I would like to see what happens on May 30th. Right, you want to see if they can get yeah. some actual results. Maybe he'll listen. Right, mm-hmm. maybe. But I think that at the point yeah. where we are happy with the results, it's absolutely time to get rid of him. This is not his first folly. He's had quite a few, um, most notably. There's a lot of superintendents that just circulate around the state, to be quite honest with you. They do. And you know what's super scary, Jeannie, as I've done the research, the superintendent and the board are accountable to nobody. I called our regional director in Lake County. Well, they're supposed to be accountable to the voters. Yeah. I mean, well, that is, that's what uh, elections matter. I elections, know. elections have consequences. Have consequences. Yeah. 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 But yeah. unfortunately, yeah. besides the, bo- the voters, they're not accountable to anyone else. There's a regional superintendent, Dr. Michael Carner, in Lake County, who's useless. I've called the Illinois State Board of Education. And they refer no, me to it's the voters. The voters it have is. to take the school board controls it, and the school board, weak school boards, listen to the administration headed by a superintendent who came up through the ranks of the yes. teaching profession and the administration of profession, who um, is only can do, going to do the bidding of the people who he went up through the ranks with, yes. rather than the bidding of the board. If you don't yes. have a strong school board. You're yeah. going to be controlled by the the, the bureaucracy, and it that is. is exactly what's happening everywhere in Illinois. Uh-huh. Um, I want to focus. We've got about five minutes sure. left. I want to focus on your uh, your mental health professional. Yes, and so, no, I'm a practice manager, so I'm not okay. an actual clinician. Okay, mm-hmm. all right, but but maybe you can speak to this though. Yeah. So. 
what are you seeing in your mental health practice? Sure. I mean, what are the what are the type of cases that are coming in? Sure. What are the age groups? Um, I, I, sure. Yeah, just tell well, us I can't more. really comment specifically, okay, sure. and I don't have access to any type of patient records, but of course I do not. help our intake team. I will say our practice, like every other practice, it, the demand outweighs the supply uh, exponentially. And we are working so hard, like every practice, to hire therapists, but there's only so many available for hire. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to continue. You know, what was done to society during during the lockdowns, in blue states particularly, of course, mm-hmm. my gosh, the impact on mental health, and this is just my life observation, not as a professional, so many people are struggling. And it seems that there's just no end to it. It really does. And unfortunately... I think demand will continue to outweigh supply in the mental health industry. I really do. You mentioned that your office is constantly full. We are. Yeah, as soon as we we are always, even though we do try and accommodate as best we can, it's really hard in our peak hours because, of course, most peak hours are after school and evening and weekends. Mm -hmm. It's tough to find spots, but we are not alone. We are definitely not alone. I think every mental health practice, I I know every mental health practice is in the same boat as we are right now. Well, I would say that, you know, when it comes to the students and the teenagers, Mm -hmm. there's a real push Mm -hmm. in the school systems to essentially say, you know, for, for in many cases, we're not going to engage the parents on particular issues. Oh, I hate this. We're not, we're going to let our own mental health professionals in our school system right. engage the student and not necessarily involve the parents. I've so that. now there, there's probably, obviously, hmm. schools are a conduit to, dis- to discovering abuse. There, there's no doubt about that. Oh, of course. I mean, everybody knows that. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, they're, they're, they're in touch in, in certain yeah. ways. But there's a little something more nefarious going on, and that is that the schools are now overstepping parental mm-hmm. rights. And they're, mm-hmm. they're essentially, well, I mean, obviously, they've got a lot, all of them have mm-hmm. these gender affirming plans oh. where if the, the student wants to pretend that they are a sex that they are not bio- yeah. biologically. Yeah you know, are, then, uh, and they, they don't want their parents to know, then they can help them transition on their own. Now, this is, this is horrific. Yeah. But it goes to the, the other thing, which is, um, at what point are the parents, do the parents, need, the parents have some responsibility in all of this? Oh, 100%. 100%. So, I mean, and I would say that's true, like, of the, 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 the teenagers, the mm. chaos that the teenagers caused mm. in Chicago just mm. a couple weekends oh, ago. Oh, my goodness. I mean, come on. Don't just, first of all, there were hundreds of teenagers, yeah. and I think there was, a, you know, what was it, 16 people? nine adults and seven kids or something were arrested. Yeah. Where are the parents? I wish I where, where, where are the parents in all of this? I mean, I, I look at this yeah. and I don't know why a, a high school student bought, brought the gun to school. Obviously, yeah. he, he's, he doesn't have parents that care or something's yeah, going or on there. they didn't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know much about his case, but I will say one comment I'd love to make is... okay. Uh, on the metal detectors and, par- and parents and mental health, et cetera, is um, some of the resistance I've seen is that we don't want uh, – a mother actually said this to me, so this is my experience. Okay. Well, I don't want my daughter to feel like she's in a prison. And I said to her, better a prison than a coffin. And she actually got it. But I would say this is a time for parents to take the wheel – when I pray we do install metal detectors, and not just at Highland Park, I'd like to see them at schools nationwide. It is up to the parents, it is up to us to say to our students, to educate them, no, you're not in a prison. And I also think that comment it is a bit ridiculous given that, especially in a community like Highland Park where there is great wealth, mm-hmm. these kids have flown, they've traveled, they've gone That's through metal detectors. Right. Yeah. 
So I think in terms of mental health, the, the first line of defense, shall I say, and I'm speaking as a mother, um, should be the parents. The parents need to take the wheel back from these administrators and teachers who may be overstepping their boundaries or projecting. Like, for example, if the board projects that the students will feel that they're in prison. No, no, no. Let us, the parents, handle that. You invest in the infrastructure to keep them safe, which is actually their job. We will handle the rest. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously, I, I would think that the police department would be on top of this. I think that they would be all in favor of it. Better to have warning yeah. ahead of time than of to have course. to respond to something like they right. had in Uvalde right. um, and where the police did not respond. Yes. Uh, oh. I, I imagine the police did, did, were great with their response on that day. They were, but as I understand, it still took 10 minutes. And oh, see, and so that the, the teacher with the sledgehammer, I'm sorry if the guy's got a, I know, you know, and we love him, you know, a shotgun a, and whatever. I mean, I'm, I bet he's a great guy. He's a wonderful but, man, and he just had knee surgery, and God bless him for getting down on the floor and doing that. But again, I said this um, to some of the media, the sledgehammer defense, that would be fine in 1823, maybe 1923, but in 2023, can't we do better for our children? Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Uh, you, I'll have you back. I'll definitely I want an update so. about how uh, you guys progress with your request to get metal detectors in. And I want to find out more about eventually what happens with the, st the student um, that brought the gun to, to the school. Everybody should need to, needs to know. They need to know that their mm -hmm. kids are going to be safe and this, that the guy is not there anymore. So, You got it. Well, thanks for joining me on The Real Story with Jeannie Ives. Appreciate it. Thank you.